Endocrinology Outpatient Type 2 Diabetes Mellitus Screening Type 2 Diabetes Mellitus Screening is recommended for individuals aged greater than or equal to 45 years or after gestational diabetes, or if body mass index is greater than or equal to 25 and presents additional risk factors. These risk factors include having a first-degree relative with diabetes, non-white ethnicity, history of cardiovascular disease, hypertension, low high-density lipoprotein levels, high triglyceride levels, polycystic ovary syndrome, and a sedentary lifestyle. Screening should be conducted every three years if results are normal. Prediabetes. Prediabetes is diagnosed when certain criteria are met. A1C levels of 5.7 to 6.4 percent, fasting plasma glucose levels of 100 to 125, or a 75G oral glucose tolerance test with a 2-hour glucose reading of 140 to 199. Monitoring includes A1C checks at least annually, with more frequent screenings every 6 months if A1C levels are between 6 to 6.4 percent. Lifestyle interventions are the primary treatment, and metformin is effective, especially under specific conditions. Diabetes. The diagnosis of diabetes is confirmed if A1C levels are greater than or equal to 6.5%, FPG levels are greater than or equal to 126, OGTT 2-hour glucose readings are greater than or equal to 200, or random blood glucose levels are greater than or equal to 200 with accompanying symptoms. Diagnosis should be confirmed, except in cases of severe symptoms and random glucose levels exceeding 200. The goal for A1C levels is to be below 7%, but this may be adjusted if life expectancy is less than or equal to 10 years or if there's a high risk of hypoglycemia. Healthcare maintenance. During every visit, healthcare practitioners should review blood sugar logs, medication regimens, blood pressure, weight, BMI, conduct foot exams, and screen for substance use. Monitoring every three to six months includes A1C levels, lipid profile, urine microalbumin to creatinine ratio, neuropathy exams, retinopathy screens, and liver function tests. Annually, vaccinations for influenza, hepatitis B, pneumococcal vaccines should be given. Basal insulin management. Criteria for initiating basal insulin include an A1C level greater than or equal to 9%, fasting blood glucose greater than or equal to 250, or symptomatic patients. Initial doses of basal insulin range from 0.1 to 0.2 units kg day or 10 units day, with consideration for weight. Choices between long-acting insulin or intermediate-acting insulin are made based on patient factors. Titration involves increasing doses every three days until fasting Berg levels are within 80 to 130, without causing hypoglycemia. Prandial insulin management. Prandial insulin is considered if A1C levels are not at target despite basal insulin being greater than 0.5 units kg day, and fasting glucose is within the target range. Initial doses involve adding rapid-acting insulin before the largest meal, typically 4 units or 0.1 units kg. Adjustments occur every 3 days until target glucose levels are reached. Insulin supplies. Proper insulin administration requires universal pen needles or syringes, preferably 32 g 4 mm due to reduced pain. Syringes should be the smallest size that holds the required dose. Glucometers and test strips vary based on insurance coverage. All durable medical equipment prescriptions require an ICD-10 code. Algorithm for oral anti-diabetic therapy. Management starts with lifestyle changes and metformin if A1C greater than or equal to 6.5%. Additional medications are introduced based on factors such as cardiovascular risk, heart failure or chronic kidney disease, weight loss, and cost considerations. Specific medications, metformin, first-line therapy that decreases hepatic glucose production. Administered at 500 to 1,000 mg bid. Side effects include nausea, bloating, diarrhea, and potential B12 deficiency. SGLT2 inhibitors block renal glucose reabsorption, leading to cardiovascular event reduction, weight loss, and blood pressure reduction. Potential side effects include urinary tract infections and genital fungal infections. 
GLP-1 receptor agonists stimulate glucose-dependent insulin release, resulting in cardiovascular event reduction and weight loss. Side effects may include gastrointestinal symptoms and risk of pancreatitis. DPP-4 inhibitors increase insulin secretion, safe for patients with chronic kidney disease. Side effects include joint pain. Insulin secretagogues. These stimulate insulin release, but carry a risk of hypoglycemia and weight gain. Insulin nomenclature and management. Understanding insulin nomenclature is crucial. Basal insulin meets basic metabolic needs. Prandial insulin covers meals, and correctional insulin corrects hyperglycemia. Premixed insulin combines basal and prandial insulin while insulin GDT is used in intensive care units for elevated blood glucose. It's important to overlap with subcutaneous insulin before stopping insulin GDT inpatient glycemic management. Glycemic targets differ based on location. On the hospital floor, fasting blood glucose should be between 100 to 140 mg DL and random blood glucose should be below 180 mg DL. In intensive care units, the range is 140 to 180 mg DL. Frequent self-monitoring is advised for known diabetics, non-diabetics with BG above 140 mg DL, and patients undergoing therapies that may cause hyperglycemia. Admission orders. For acutely ill patients, home oral antihyperglycemic agents should be held. Basal insulin should never be held for type 1 diabetes mellitus patients. Checking A1C levels is recommended if not done in the last three months. Home insulin regimens should continue with a dose reduction of 25 to 50 percent. Initial therapy depends on the level of glycemic control. Adjusting insulin dosing. When adjusting insulin dosing, avoid changes greater than 20 percent. Special scenarios, such as glucocorticoid use, tube feeds, and insulin pump usage, require individualized considerations. Inpatient hypoglycemia. Hypoglycemia symptoms include shakiness, anxiety, diaphoresis, seizures, and coma. Treatment follows a hierarchy. Oral glucose is preferable, followed by intravenous glucose, and then intramuscular subcutaneous glucagon. Special caution is needed in cases of sulfonylurea overdose. Insulin formulations and dosing adjustments. Insulin formulations differ in onset, peak, and duration. Rapid and short-acting insulin cover different time frames, while intermediate and long-acting insulin provide basal coverage. Adjustments should be made based on fasting or post-meal blood glucose levels. Insulin, proinsulin, C-peptide levels, and differential diagnosis. Insulin and proinsulin levels are elevated in insulinoma, oral hypoglycemic overdose, and autoimmune disorders. Low C-peptide levels indicate exogenous insulin administration. Differential diagnosis depends on these levels. Diabetic ketoacidosis and hyperosmolar hyperglycemic state management, DKA results from insulin deficiency, causing hyperglycemia, osmotic diuresis, and acidosis. DKA precipitants are denoted by eyes. Symptoms include dehydration, Kuzmal's respirations, and fruity breath. HHS, similar to DK, occurs due to hyperglycemia and dehydration, but without significant ketogenesis. HHS is characterized by gradual onset and altered mental status. DK and HHS management steps. Managing DK involves volume resuscitation, potassium repletion, insulin therapy, and electrolyte management. HHS is managed similarly to DK, but with more aggressive intravenous fluid administration. Transitioning to subcutaneous insulin is based on glucose levels and improved mental status. It's important to note that this information is provided for educational purposes and should not replace medical advice from qualified healthcare professionals. Diabetes management requires individualized approaches and patients should always consult with their healthcare providers for personalized guidance.